it's loading. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to start now. Yeah. So please welcome our next <laughs> presenter, Matthias and Paul Frields. And Paul. So uh, welcome everybody. Sorry for the uh, the, in the interruption. Sorry for the the uh, trouble getting started here. We uh, we ended up being um, delayed a bit by the last speaker, and then and then technology happened. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll be taking that out of your your next bonus. Um, I'll talk to Denise about that. Yeah. Um, I know you don't. That's uh, yeah. It's probably good because you, you know what's going on. So workstation. Um, we're going to talk about Fedora Workstation. As Matthew uh, indicated earlier, 80% of the downloads are Fedora Workstation. Um, we're going to kind of speed through the beginning here and talk a little bit about the background of Workstation. I think before we start, uh, we should say that um, if this, this talk doesn't go well and it's boring, then you can blame Christian Schaller, who was supposed to be here and give this talk. <laughs> but he's expecting his second child any day now, so he decided to stay home for that yeah. and sent us instead. All right, so this is what we're going to cover uh, here, basically, why do we have a workstation, what's, uh, Matthias is going to uh, explain what we've done so far, what's happening now, we're going to talk about the outlook for, uh, for the future. All right, so why a workstation? Uh, for the main reason is because uh, it appeals to a broad range of users. Um, the, the workstation, we've talked about it targeting uh, software developers, and that is indeed uh, our focus for features. It's our focus for how we make decisions about um, what priorities we have and what's going to matter. But the important thing to remember is that um, developers are not unlike other people, right? They have 90% of the same needs that any of us have. I'm not a software developer, but most of the things that happen in Workstation actually benefit me as a user, right? Because developers share a lot in common with other productivity users. So the way we talk about this is it's not an exclusive set, right? So when people come in and, and I guess want to uh, want to talk about uh, the, the very, the, the, the very uh, esoteric subject of target audience, um, I usually get bored and fall asleep at that point because I think we've done a pretty good job of explaining this, but I'm explaining it here again, is that uh, developers are a central focus, but the things that we do for them tend to benefit all users, um, and we do care about that. Um, developers also like to play movies on their desktop, for example. Um, so who is it who's working on this stuff? The Workstation Working Group. Um, we have a close collaboration with uh, other upstream. So the, the, the working group itself is made up of several people. Matthias sits on the working group. I sit on the working group. Um, uh, there's a number of people who I think are not represented here today uh, who are part of it. Um, Ryan Lurch, uh, 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 Kalev yeah. Lember, uh, with, uh, Rex Dieter uh, is one, uh, uh, definitely helps keep us oriented with the free desktop standards and making sure that we work well with, uh, with other desktops as well as we move on in technology. So as we're doing this, we collaborate closely with other upstreams like uh, the GNOME community, obviously, where we get a huge amount of technology. So the things that you see in Fedora Workstation, um, these uh, we're, we're although we're proud of them um, being in Fedora, uh, a, the, a huge, huge thanks um, and respect goes out to the GNOME.org community because they are actually creating the stuff that we are integrating uh, downstream in Fedora. I, and of course, there are other things that we pick up as well, LibreOffice, um, Mozilla Firefox, and so forth. And there are minor variances, so we don't, um, simply take things from the upstream and then plop them down, right? We do actually think about some curation. We think about what are the things that the developer who sits on a Fedora workstation is going to want installed by default. Um, and we do make some, some, some choices uh, to make sure that that's a smooth experience and that it matches our, you know, matches our focus. I'm just going to actually use the down arrow here. It's easier. Right, okay. That's what I take over here. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, what we've done so far. Uh, as the slide says, the workstation is, I think, three releases old now. We started in 21, 22, 23. And uh, so far, we've had a, I think, fairly conservative approach to the changes we've made. Um, there's a, and to, to organize what we're doing, in, in particular for the workstation, we, uh, we keep a task list on the wiki. You can look at that if you are interested in all the details. Um, uh, here I want to just like call out a few of the highlights. So on the next slide, if you go on. Um, I'll start with talking about uh, software installation. That's been a, a really important focus area for us. Um, GNOME software is the uh, application we have for that. And it has, has come a long way since we first started doing it. Um, 
One area where we've really improved things is um, that Richard, who's sitting up there, has been really successful in uh, pushing and pulling both upstreams and um, packages to provide us with um, better app data. App data is the descriptions, keywords, screenshots, and translations for that that we need to like present applications well in the UI. And so Richard has been like using the carrot and the stick quite a bit to um, give us that data from, uh, from the people who maintain those packages. And um, that not only helps us for representing the applications well in the UI, but it also helps us for making them searchable. So the keywords in particular, that you really find applications better. And another aspect in which we've improved uh, the search experience is that we also show the application search results in the GNOME shell overview. So if you're searching for something in, in the shell, then you'll find applications there as well. Another thing we've done here is um, we've uh, reintegrated uh, the um, codec and font and other uh, extra extras installation into GNOME software that used to be provided by GNOME Package Kit. And now it's all in one place, so we don't need to include GNOME Package Kit anymore at all. The last uh, point on this slide here is about application add-ons. That's a concept that uh, we introduced in GNOME software because one size does not really quite fit all when it comes to like showing applications. There are lots of complicated applications, like for instance Eclipse, which come with tons of plugins, and we kind of want to be able to like support that well in GNOME software, so we added the concept of add-ons. And for that, we also need application metadata or add-on metadata, and I think that's still a little bit of an ongoing process to ensure that we have quality data for that as well. Right, um, next thing to call out here um, is the terminal. That's obviously a very important application for developers, myself included. Spend most of your day in the terminal. And it's also an application that has a very long history and there's very strong <laughs> expectations for how a terminal application is supposed to behave. So any change we make here kind of has to be approached very carefully. Uh, nevertheless, we try to identify a few things where we could make improvements. and. Uh, I've listed a few here. We've brought back transparency just for due to public demand. We've added uh, notifications for long run, running commands. That is when you type make in WebKit, for instance, and then it takes two hours or so. So you do something else and you forget about it. But when it's done, you get a notification. That's nice. And then there's, again, search. It's a repeat, uh, repeat topic here. Um, the Chrome shell search also shows you your open terminals. And uh, one thing, and one last point I wanted to make about terminals is that um, the upstream GNOME terminal maintainers are also a conservative bunch. So this is a, an example for where we introduced a bunch of work that we first did downstream. And then we tried to convince them to take it upstream. And I think at this point, only the transparency is still the downstream patch. Right, um, some more small things here. There's, of course, a lot of, lot of change that has happened over three releases. And I cannot list all of this here. Um, so what, I, what I wanted to say about these is um, we try to address like the real concerns that people have and when they use a Linux desktop and try to make a change for the better. And one concern that we've heard repeatedly is that battery life is an issue. If you use your Mac, that's much better. And on Linux, we're not doing so well. So we try to um, make an effort to, to improve this. And one of the outcomes of that is that we added support for handling the backlight automatically. That's a big power drain in the laptop maybe the biggest one that we can actually affect. So if you have, happen to have a laptop that has an ambient light sensor, you can enjoy this feature. Or you can, again, go to Richard and buy a ColorHack ALS, which gives that as a little USB thingy. And what I also want to say here, this is another example of a feature where uh, the UI that we added in the control center to turn this on is really just the tip of the iceberg. We had to do all the user space plumbing. We had to write, had to write a service. I think that's called IIO sensor proxy. And we had to work with kernel developers to fix driver bugs uh, before we could actually put this tiny bit of UI in place on top of it. Yeah, I think I'll skip the other two points here. Hang on. Back to Paul. Am I on again? There we go. Okay, so uh, we have a couple graphs, right? We didn't want to be the only people who showed up to the gunfight without a gun, so we have some graphs for you. Um, 
So right now, and, and Matthew's gonna recognize a couple of these, right? At least the next one I think I actually just lifted from his presentation. So um, this is a, a, a quick graph of some of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, reports that we get back from ABRT. Um, and in, you know, we, in looking at this, you're gonna see different colors here, right? Um, you know, the red line here is, is our current release, Fedora 23, so that's why you don't really see much happening until, until recently. Um, we've managed to cut down on a lot of the noise that's, uh, that happens in, um, in ABRT. I think that's why there's a much larger mass up here. But one of the things that's been going on is, um, for example, our, uh, the Fedora kernel team um, has done a good job working with the ABRT guys to, to get rid of some of the noise that's there. Um, but also, you know, we, we uh, tend to use the statistics that come out of the retrace server to sort of power the... Uh, the, our, our efforts to look at certain bugs, so look at the things that are rising to the top, the things that are causing the most user pain, um, the highest incidence of reports, and sort of address those. And as you can see, uh, in general, uh, even though you know F20, F23 certainly has had a, had a rise in bugs, I'm sorry, it's a little bit obscured by the, by the controls here for the, for the um, slideshow, uh, but you can see that it's really not peaking anywhere near what we were seeing just in the very last release, Fedora 22. So we feel like we're doing a, a pretty good job of, of uh, taking care of some of those issues. It's really started to make a dent in the perceived quality of Fedora overall, um, not just the workstation, but certainly that is what we concentrate on. All right, and you'll recognize this from, from Matthew's slides, the, the geologic ages of Fedora. And you know, just the point that we wanted to make here, I think, is that um, with the advent of the additions, and the huge rise in this green area, right, from Fedora 21 forward, um, we really look at this as a huge opportunity and something that people have definitely, uh, people have definitely uh, glommed onto this idea that these additions can be better at focusing on a specific audience and doing something and doing it well, as opposed to having you know, one, um, uh, one edition or one thing that we produce that everybody then has to sort of tune in their own way. If we can actually do some pre-tuning of those things before they get to their, the people that use them, we can do a lot better job of serving those folks. Is there anything else you wanted to say about that? No, I just yeah. uh, want to say I love this graph. It's so nice and colorful. Great job, man. <laughs> it's very rainbow-like. Yeah. I, I really like, I like the purple thing because that was when I was FPL, that, that was my, that was my age, the age. What was it? The stick thoracic. There you go. I like it. All right, thanks. I guess um, I take over again here at this point. Um, talking a little bit about um, what's coming in Fedora 24. So that's the near future. Uh, Matthew stole a little bit of my thunder for this slide because he talked about a bunch of this stuff already. But I'll, I'll try to add some wrinkles here to this. So Wayland, um, first bullet point here is. Um, been uh, the focus for, for a lot of my team's efforts this cycle. We're basically really trying to um, dot the I's and cross the T's and make the Wayland session really have feature parity with the X11 session for your day-to-day -day use. So um, that you, as Matthew said, will probably not even notice that you're using Wayland. I guess from a marketing perspective, that's a bit of a nightmare as a feature. I mean, we do all this work for years, and then uh, when we do our job really well, then nobody will even notice that it has changed. So um, we'll see how that goes. As Matthew said, uh, we're still like on the finish line for this and we'll make the decision whether we are ready to declare Wayland the default for Fedora 24 before the alpha in early March. Switching X for Wayland, but the benefit is basically it's, it's enabling. I mean, on the one hand, like from an engineering perspective, it, Wayland avoids a lot of the crunkiness and the, uh, the things we had to work around in the X protocol for 20 years, but that's not interesting for users. It's interesting for us as engineers who work with the protocol. Uh, uh, Wayland enables us to isolate applications much better from each other. Like X basically was just one everything that could talk to each other, could see each other, and there was no notion of you could run an untrusted application because it could just steal all your keyboard input without you knowing. So that's basically enabling isolation sandboxing for applications. Less crunch, more security. Yes. Um, so um, as I said, it's a nightmare. The next bullet point here is much better for marketing perspective because you can actually take nice screenshots of GNOME software um, offering you a graphical upgrade. Matthew already talked about this as well. 
is basically the successor for the old pre-upgrade tool, I think it was called. And um, we'll, do, we'll do a good job here, hopefully, and uh, we'll notice that when you run Fedora 24 and the next release comes out, we'll offer you to download and install Fedora 25, and we'll, we'll try to check whether any applications or packages you have installed might break due to that, and we'll warn you about it. Uh, so that should all be in place. And that will not only be in place for going from Fedora 24 to Fedora 25, but also uh, we'll, we'll try to backport this to Fedora 20 so you can actually use it to go to Fedora 24 already. Uh, the next two bullet points here are also about GNOME software. I guess you get the sense that GNOME software really still is a very active focus of um, work for us. So BIOS firmware updates will be um, offered in GNOME software in Fedora 24. Um, if you went to Richard's talk yesterday, you learned a lot more about that than I could ever say. And if you missed it, maybe you want to check out the recording. This is really interesting to learn. And uh, XDG app installation, um, XDG app, I haven't mentioned that before, is, is our effort to define how a containerized desktop application should look, could look. And um, GNOME software will support installing these. Uh, there's gonna be a little bit of a preview in Fedora 24 because we don't actually have a lot of established uh, XDG app applications available yet to try this out on, but at least you can use this for, for instance, running uh, the latest Nightly builds or of GNOME applications, and maybe we'll get a LibreOffice XDG app as well. Um, yeah. And well, all these, uh, all these uh, items I mentioned about uh, GNOME software are basically all about making it easier to find and install software on your system. So it's about making it less important what the default applications are, because we'll have an easy time finding others. Um, we still ship default applications on the workstation, and so we did a round of uh, review of of the set of applications that we installed by default. And I think we did make some changes, but I'm blanking currently on what exactly those are. Maybe you know. Uh, I'm off the mic, but uh, I think the uh, yeah. installed. So basically, we'll, we'll, we'll ship a different set of default applications because we don't want to ship unmaintained and dead things that might have security holes in them. All right, um, there's some more items here. Um, we also try to make sure that um, the many fantastic Qt applications that are out there look uh, nice and well integrated in the workstation environment. So we'll, uh, we'll ship a Qt settings integration. I don't know what it is, a class that's called Qt GNOME Platform in Fedora 24. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it does, but I think it basically makes Qt applications ob uh, observe the GNOME settings. Yeah, and this, this is kind of like a follow-on to like the Adwaita um, right, bridge yeah. theme that, that we have. That's what an earlier slide that we yeah. also have a theme that kind of tries to make Qt applications look nicely integrated, and this is more for the settings. And the last uh, last item here, I haven't talked about GNOME Builder yet at all. GNOME Builder is, our, is an effort to um, write a nice UI for making software. And uh, currently it's pretty focused on desktop applications and desktop software, but that will probably, the focus will widen as the GNOME Builder matures. And in Fedora 24, GNOME Builder will actually take the step from being just a fancy editor to being an actual IDE by letting you build something. Right, so um, beyond Fedora 24, I said initially that so far I think we've taken a fairly conservative approach to developing the workstation. And I guess beyond Fedora 24, we'll try to make some bolder steps. The ones we outline here, we'll talk about them some more in the next slides. Did you want to talk about the uh, containerized bits or not? Well, or I, I do that when you're done there. Okay. Um, all right, so this one I'm going to talk about. I know this is controversial, and I love, these days I kind of love embracing the controversy. So um, third-party software. Um, you've heard Denise uh, earlier talking about um, different methods of, um, of, of proffering software through the distribution. So you know, the ability to have um, a workstation or a, a product that's going to be made up of, of containers. Um, one of the things that we're interested in in the workstation group um, is how are we going to open up to those to those types of formats? Um, you know, some of the some you know some of the problems that we have uh, distributing software um, can go away through some through other uh, uh, development that we've had. So, for example, the ability for um, uh, GNOME software to um, uh, 
pull in metadata uh, for search results without actually putting anything on your system that you may not be uh, you know, phil philosophically uh, in line with. So for example, um, we know for a fact that, uh, so you saw earlier, 80% of the downloads uh, that Fedora gives out nowadays are, are taken up by workstation. We also know, um, thanks to some mass polling and just general social media, that about 50% of our users install Google Chrome. <coughs> Right, and it's not as there's there's a, there's no debate over this. We know that about half of our users pull Google Chrome, so they're comfortable with that, and we understand that we have a particular free software alignment in Fedora that is not necessarily the same as our users, and that the time has come where we need to stop um, trying to restrict their choice and instead give them the freedom to choose what it is they want and uh, and stop getting in their way. So we're working with uh, Richard and working in the workstation group and with FESCO and, other, and the council and other groups to come up with a way that third party software uh, can work in a workstation while still giving people a way to understand what it is they're getting and make the informed choice of whether they want it. So for example, a Chrome user would easily be able to find Chrome and install it. Um, at the same time, someone who does not want uh, anything that's not uh, completely free and open source would be able to avoid it just as easily. And at the same time, also be able to offer alternatives to those things. So if they see Chrome's there, there may be other things available that, hey, here's something else that might suit your needs just as well. Yeah, Matthew. I, I just could emphasize that. If someone goes to Google looking for Chrome, they get Chrome. If you uh, possibly would find Chrome in the software center, they should say non-free, and then just also have a free software offering right next to it. Right. So let me, I'll, I'll make the point again since, you know, since I have the mic. Um, so the point being that if people go to google.com slash Chrome to pick up Chrome, um, they get no message other than downloading Chrome. Whereas with software, they're, you know, and, and, and of course this all has to be designed out and, and so forth. I don't want to get too, you know, too, put the cart too far ahead of the horse. But we have at least the potential uh, to in give them an indication of the fact that they're getting something non-free. And there might be alternatives available. Hey, there just happens to be this other thing that might work for you, but you know, go ahead and get what you like. So there are, there are ways to show that, um, there are ways to show that in a, I think in an elegant, in an elegant interface way. So you know, we have yet, I think, to get to that exact point, but it is something that we will pursue. Um, so that discussion will happen and yeah. Maybe like just a small addition there. I mean, we already show web applications, some web applications in GNOME software, and as part of this effort, we'll also like make those more clearly delineated and labeled as web applications, so you really get the information to like know what you're getting into when you install this thing. I, and I should also make the point: third-party software does not mean closed software exclusively, right? Third-party software could also be software that's available in like a Copa repository. Um, it could be software that's. Uh, hey, here's another example. Um, one of the 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 um, advances that we made here um, is for OpenH264, which is actually um, free and open source software, but it's available under a specific license that makes it difficult for us to offer. Um, but a vendor can offer it. Um, however, we want to make sure that uh, our users have trust with that software, and so one of the ways we can help is by basically building it and signing, that, signing it with Fedora's key, and then the vendor will be able to offer it. And of course, when the person installs their system, they want to be able to get to that, and this way we can actually provide metadata, which allows them to pull in that codec um, when it's needed. So that, and that's, that's gone through quite a long, long phase of um, sort of discussion and figuring out how we can how we can make that work and um, there are there's tickets and discussion that uh, I'll be happy to point people to if they're interested after the uh, after the talk so um, we're talking about a developer workstation so we actually also want to do something for developers and uh, since containers are all the rage as you could easily see it by looking at the schedule here uh, we want to obviously obviously support and improve our support for container development uh, one aspect of this is that um, I mentioned our own XTG app desktop application containers and we'll, we'll support building those in a nice way in Chrome Builder, obviously. But we also want to support and include tooling for other container technologies like Docker, Atomic, and so on. But um, I think nobody on our working group is actually really an expert or is working in these technologies day in, day out. So we'd, we'd be happy for some feedback and uh, for some suggestions from the field, like what are the things that we should do or could do to make your life easier 
when working with containers on the workstation. So I'd encourage you to like let us know what, what changes would be helpful for this. Right, um, so this one, um, bigger topic, uh, image-based installation. If you went to Colin Waters' uh, presentation on Friday, you've seen, um, I think, some very powerful examples of what you can do when you combine OS3 and RPMs. I think this um, boundary between image-based and package-based technologies is kind of like the hottest area where we will see the most interesting developments regarding to containers and uh, in the future. And of course, we want to get in on this and benefit from it as the workstation. We don't want to be left behind and become irrelevant. I think Matthew had some words towards that as well. He said Atomic is the OS of the future. So we want to be part of that. And uh, with that in mind, we set ourselves the goal to have as an option an image-based installation for the workstation in for Fedora 25. And we hope to get out of this the same things that uh, Atomic claims as advantages for their image-based installation. Basically, we'll get a tested, installable image that you can download and we avoid all of the problems and uh, issues that can come from combining an unknown set of uh, unknown package versions on the client system and hopefully um, have a much more stable and robust uh, overall system for people to use. And it'll be easier to roll back, something that RPM was never good at and OS3 is supposedly really good at. So the so, question was, how big is the image and how big are the updates? Right. Um, if you know anything about uh, OS3, I mean, the image will probably, if you download it for the first time, be pretty much the same size as like your uh, ISO is now, right? It's the same content, just shipped in a different form. And for updates, um, OS3 works very similar to Git. Like you get just the delta of like what, whatever changed in very smart ways. So I hope that we can actually maybe make updates a lot more efficient this way as well. Uh, what else did I want to say here? Oh, I was going to note that um, the, the write-up is labeled Atomic Workstation, but I want to be really clear that that is not going to be the name that we will out. Like, eventually, I think this is actually just going to be the workstation. So this is just a way for us to refer to it as different than, uh, right. than the way we should Atomic Workstation is basically the code name here for, this, uh, for the project of defining what we want here. Uh, so there's this wiki page, which has a fairly detailed write-up that you can, can go to. And yeah, I wanted to stress that, of course, this is a fairly ambitious goal, I think, to reach by Fedora 25. And of course, we cannot make like this as a all or nothing jump. So traditional installs will obviously still be available. And also, um, we're hoping to enable what RPM OS3 offers in uh, so-called layered package installation. So even if you have an image-based install and you need this one other package that is for some reason not included in the image, you should be able to install that locally. Uh, RPM OS3 has pretty smart uh, ways to do that. It basically recomposes another image locally that includes this extra RPM and supports that in a nice way. All right, just some other collaboration that's going to be going on in the workstation over this year. Um, you probably you heard Fedora Hubs mentioned um, in Matt's talk, and, and hopefully you've heard of, about it if you've been around Fedora for a while, um, this sort of uh, juicing up of our uh, our ability to bring together applications and services in one place so that contributors have an easier way of working together, um, also a way that presents the work that our communities are doing um, in a way that's uh, it's more pleasant and it makes it easier for new people um, to get involved, which has always been uh, has always been difficult. This is an idea that's been kicking around in Fedora for years, like I think since the time I was FPL, um, and, uh, and, and I was talking with uh, Luke Mackin and sort of just drawing things on a piece of paper with him. Um, so we're really hoping that this is, uh, it really is time for this to happen now that we have great technologies like the messaging bus, the fed message bus that, uh, uh, that, that allows our apps and services to talk to each other. Um, also the developer portal. Um, I don't know if, if Peter Hracek is here, but uh, his team actually works on the, um, the Fedora developer portal, and we want to have uh, we want to have a closer relationship with them, so that when you install the workstation, if you are a software developer, um, that there is a there is a fluid way for you to to get. Uh, up-to-date information and resources and the things that you need to get started and 
uh, you know, a lot of these developers are going to be experienced folks, right? And they may not need those resources. They know where to go upstream for their API, uh, you know, for their API documentation and things like that. But we also know that a lot of the a lot of developers coming in are going to be new, right? Students are one of the are one of the subgroups that we look at. Um, for, uh, for software developers. And so giving them an easy way to find upstream documentation, giving them an easy way to find some tips and things that they need um, to get started um, is, is something that we hope to engage the developer portal folks with. Um, so the tie in between hubs and portal and between both of those in the workstation is going to be, is going to be important going forward. All right, so challenges. I think this is mine too, yeah? Uh -huh. so, so challenges. Uh, and you heard me mention this earlier. Um, I talked about the Open H264 um, initiative to, to actually provide, um, to provide a, a specific kind of codec for folks. Um, but the biggest thing that we hear, uh, regardless of what forum you go to, regardless of where you're looking, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Google+, um, Ask Fedora, any of, those, any of the places where people try Fedora and then look for help. By far, um, the biggest difficulty and the biggest hurdle that people face um, is codecs. Um, and so this is, again, this is one of the reasons that uh, in, this, in the workstation we are going to be looking to make that installation easier for people um, so that they can get the things that they want. Now, in, in, in some way, right, the web, uh, web browser vendors are kind of starting to make this easier for us, especially when you think about an example like Google Chrome, where basically you're getting all the support in your browser, and since most people are doing work there, as opposed to you know, bringing down random content and then using native applications to do it, uh, it, it may be that that, that, that essentially is a, is a problem that's going to be solved for us. But a lot of people still want to manage content on their own. It's one of the, one of the drawing points for getting a Linux uh, distribution at all. And so we want to make sure that they are not uh, inconvenienced further um, than other folks uh, to be able to get the things that they need. Cohesive tools. Um, this is important too, right? Right now, I, I think a GNOME Builder is is one of the best, you know, one of the best things out there to address this, right? Um, we've we've had a uh, we have a long history of there being uh, lots of different tools um, to work on software, and and a lot of developers do prize that, and we're not looking to take take that away, of course, because we are looking for people to be able to install other packages on top of an atomic technology workstation. Um, but having a set of cohesive tools that actually feel like your operating system was sort of created as a thing and tested as a thing, as one user experience, um, is important. So having more cohesive tools is something that we're, we're trying to do. And hardware experience, so the, the point I wanted to make here is that for a long time people have been looking for um, something like a, a hardware compatibility list. Um, as you guys know, you know it's, it, that's, that's sort of an, that's an easy problem when you are, say, an Apple and you control um, sort of the end-to-end end experience from the manufacturing all the way to the delivery um, of hardware and software. Um, we are dealing with, and, and you know, Josh Boyer, who's up here in the front row from the Fedora Kernel team, knows firsthand that you know we have to deal with a wide variety of hardware, and uh, it's it's basically a, an impossible job to try and be perfect everywhere. But one of the things that we might be able to do uh, is uh, an engagement with maybe a single vendor, right, one or two vendors, and find out if there's a way that we can uh, ensure that Fedora is a first-class experience. Um, on those hardware, uh, on those on on those hardware lines, um, so that's something that we've we've looked into a bit already, and I, and we may uh, we may be kicking that up a bit in the next year to see if we can find a, uh, a vendor that's that actually gives that experience that we want. That being said, um, right now I'd say you know Fedora is probably uh, probably the best it's ever been at uh, at working everywhere reasonably well or better. Um, so hopefully that 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 helps quite a bit in this area. And finally, um, getting involved. Um, so if you're interested in Workstation, um, we do have an IRC channel. Um, there's a mailing list, of course. It's the list that we've used forever for, uh, for desktop um, development in Fedora. Um, and finally, I, you know, again, I, I, it can't be overstated that we get so much support from the folks in the GNOME project. Uh, if people are interested in the technology that is going into a lot of these tools that we're using, um, really the best place to get involved is upstream. Right, and uh, and that it, that benefits not just Fedora; it benefits other downstreams as well. Um, so hopefully, these are, are good ways to um, to sort of crack that nut. And I think with that, that's the end, and we can take some questions. Yeah. Do we have any time for questions? Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes yeah. Beautiful.
Yes, Langdon. So the question, so the question was: Is there, is there any plan for users to be able to add in GNOME software metadata of their own? Well, that's, I mean, that's a question for Richard, probably. <laughs> he happens to be here, so can I put you on the spot, Richard? <laughs> I should probably. We'll say um, we're currently sure. working on adding review functionality, right? So that you can like review software and and, and send reviews. Maybe there's a so there's an a angle there where we can collect this kind of stuff as well. Yeah. So if it's a keyword that you're kind of searching for, something that is an obvious keyword, it makes sense to add it upstream. And the question would be, how do you find upstream? So if you file a f uh, Red Hat Fedora bug, hopefully the package maintainer would then forward it upstream and put it in the right place. Uh, sometimes the application metadata is packaged in the SRPM rather than upstream, in which case the packager can just fix it for you. Um, we're also adding a reviews feature, hopefully for Fedora 24. So if you, th hopefully maybe we control some of that data for search results as well, um, which is more user provided. But I'd say always try and contact upstream if possible. And just and just a note. So since I have a I have an upstream and a package in Fedora, I know for a fact that Richard actually sent out emails um, to let packagers know that where what they need to do to add that metadata. So they are aware of it for sure at this point. Yeah. I think it's a start. Oh yeah, start big time. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Good question. So the question is, how would an how would an atomic-based workstation affect other spins? Um, actually, probably very little because I don't foresee that this replaces um, current methods for putting together the operating system. It would be additive. Now, while in workstation, if this works out, I think that you know this is the way that we would like to go in the future. It wouldn't prevent other spins or other labs or any other uh, piece of the distribution from keeping the same legacy way of putting together, you know, a group of RPMs into an install image. So it's it's additive and not some, you know, not exclusive. Yeah. I agree. Yes. So hang on, I'll come down and get the and get the answer. But the question was, um, the automatic backlight features is something that was implemented in kernel, and here's our kernel guy. So so there's there's two different parts to it. There's a device driver for the actual ambient light sensor uh, that that is done in kernel. But then you actually need a user space to set policy, right? Because we refuse to set policy in kernel because what you find comfortable to view in bright or light or dark situations, um, you know, I probably don't. So we need the kernel driver, and there are some. Um, the problem is, like every other device on the planet, there's you know multiple devices for that class of hardware, right? So there's tons of drivers, uh, and making sure they get loaded. And then we need the GNOME stack to interface with those and set policy according to what you have selected. All right, I think that's all we have time for. So thank you guys for coming, and Thanks. please stay tuned to the workstation. It's going to be awesome.